Okay, so it's certainly it's nice to see that you're not like my second year undergraduate class because for the second lecture I had significantly less come back for them <laughs> than uh, here. So, part two. Um, so, it was a very brief introduction and now we're going to focus on one, how, how we use quantum dynamics, so how we actually solve the time-dependent Schroeder equation. I'm going to talk about the MCTDH method. So this is the multi-configuration or time-dependent Hartree method. Um, and um, this, is, this is the most efficient way of doing rigorous quantum dynamics. And, and then I'm going to talk about how we develop these model potential energy surfaces that we need to perform the quantum dynamics. Okay, so this is just the same slide that was before. And we have said we have these two distinct classes of approach um, where we will either do grid based quantum dynamics or on the fly, what was generally called on the fly or direct uh, dynamics. These have various advantages or disadvantages. So, direct, um, so grid-based methods, as I said, we take uh, our, the, the, the model potential that we've developed in the, degree of free, in the number of degrees of freedom, so a number of, say, molecular normal modes, and we represent it on a grid of points, and each at each time step, a grid point has a certain amplitude of the wave function. And then we evolve that, so then the next time step, different grid points get amplitude. Um, the advantages of this is that we get a completely rigorous description, um, description within the limits of the potential. Now, this, this uh, is quite a big if, uh, because we have to describe the potential accurately. Uh, but once we have the potential model, if this represents um, our system well, then we get an entirely rigorous description. The fact that we're, we're using a model uh, can actually give us quite a nice intuitive uh, picture of the dynamics. So we can really explicitly see certain degrees of freedom moving and, and also take into, take into account certain couplings or certain degrees of freedom and turn them off, turn them back on again um, and see how they affect the dynamics. So this can give us um, um, generally an easier way of uh, getting a, a mechanistic viewpoint of the dynamics. Uh, it's a very well established method. Uh, the ways of doing this have been developed since the 80s. Uh, and so uh, really the only limiting uh, aspect is, uh, is calculating the potential. I don't know why there's rigorous here again, but okay. So the disadvantages, um, the, the scaling. So if you, have, if you have a grid that you have 10 points along the, that grid, um, then for one degree of freedom, you have 10 grid points. For two, you have 100 grid points. 10 degrees of freedom, you have 10 to the 10 grid points. So you can see very quickly this becomes a problem. Another limitation is including an atomistic environment, okay? So generally, uh, if you want to, if the effect of the environment is important, this is generally modeled in a phenomenological way. Okay? So an example of this is if we photo excite our system, let's say, into the S, S7 state, right? and that's got an energy of 5 electron volts, 
And then we get this non-adiabatic decay of the dynamics all the way down to the S1 state, which is what we're interested in. And that has an energy of two electron volts. That energy difference, that three electron volts, is taken from the electronic system and put into the nuclear system. So we now have a very hot molecule that's vibrating around. In what happens in reality is that this, the, this energy, this 3EV, which is what, about 30,000 Kelvin, um, is going to be distributed throughout the molecule. It's also then going to couple with the environment, if that environment is a solvent or a matrix, gonna, uh, and you're going to get a vibrational energy transfer to neighboring molecules. When we set up a model potential energy surface with a reduced number of coordinates, this is not going to happen. Because if we've taken our molecule with 150 degrees of freedom, and uh, we've only included 10 of them, then that energy that we've got in the system cannot go into these other 110 degrees of freedom that we haven't included, and it also cannot go to the environment. Okay. So this is, this is something that you have to bear in mind. Um, also, one of the other disadvantages if we, is we have to calculate the model beforehand. As I said, if the model, if the, if the molecule is particularly rigid, then it can be quite easy to establish what are the, the, the motions that should be included. But sometimes this is not so clear. And if we don't check this carefully, then we, uh, then we can really bias what the simulation is telling us. If we go for the grid-based approach, we don't need to calculate the model beforehand. We can just shove it in. Potential is calculated on the fly. We can include the environment. Okay? So it's a lot easier for these grid-based methods, things like tra trajectory surface hopping, to include an atomistic description of the environment um, and also the coupling to it. If you're looking to publish in, in one of the glossy journals, it produces very nice movies that um, experimentalists love. Uh, <laughs> see Andy rolling his eyes. <laughs> um, it does, uh, yes, it, uh, it, it does slightly annoy me sometimes. But um, Disadvantages. This is still a very computationally expen expensive method. Okay? Don't think that by switching from this to this, you're, you're, making, uh, you're making your life easy and very uh, computationally cheap. Um, you're making the nuclear motion cheaper, but in some ways uh, the quantum chemistry is actually becoming harder. Okay, so essentially what you're doing is replacing one problem but putting another in. As I said, again, it's about knowing what approximations you can get away with. Converging is difficult. The time of the simulations also tend to be limited. If you have a model that, that accurately represents your system, then it's possible to run dynamics for picoseconds, nanoseconds. With these on-the-fly dynamics, generally femtoseconds is still um, the, the limit. OK, so because I like models, we're and generally what we use, um, I'm going to focus a bit more now on grid-based quantum dynamics. If people are interested uh, in, in the surface hopping approaches, uh, you can certainly show examples and, and discuss that a bit later on. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. We want to solve the nuclear motion. So uh, we have our potential energy surface. We're going to assume that at this point. Um, and uh, um, we now want to propagate the nuclear wave packet over it. Standard grid-based approach for doing this is having some basis functions. So if you imagine a harmonic oscillator, 
the initial point could be your basis functions could be the uh, the vibrational energy levels of the harmonic oscillator, and then you have some time dependent coefficients, and this essentially controls the mixing of these basis functions, so how much of these basis functions you need to describe the wave function. This scales, as I said, this scales exponentially with the, uh, uh, due to the inclusion of the grid. The MCTDH method is slightly different. Um, it should be pointed out that this still scales exponentially because we've still got a grid, but the exponential scaling of this approach is different, uh, is, is reduced for two reasons. First difference is that these basis functions now um, evolve with time. And what this means is that if we have, for example, some initial wave function here, and then after however many uh, 100 femtoseconds, our wave function is now over here. In this standard approach, we have to have basis functions that inc um, incorporate this whole range of space. The fact that the MCDDH method, the basis functions evolve with time, means that they, they evolve to best describe the, the, the system. So initially, we could have some basis functions here. And then as they evolve, they evolve with the system to describe your wave function over here. The advantage of this is that to achieve the correct solution, we now need less basis functions than we did before. So we still have exponential scaling, but the scaling is reduced. And so we can uh, treat um, more degrees of freedom. Okay, so the equations of motions are obtained by using the dirac frankel variational principle. Um, and essentially, say we get a rigorous solution to the time evolution of the system. Points to note, okay, MCDH still scales exponentially, um, but the effective number of degrees